Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of Can We Please Talk Podcast live in D.C. D.C., make some noise. Come on. All right. I think that's because they haven't had a few drinks yet, so we're going to have a few drinks. I bet soon enough, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, as you know, I am Mike Leon. And glad I did not send my kid to Donda Academy with Kanye West. I'm Nick Severic. These are getting worse and worse. I apologize hey, for that, folks. The school just closed. I know, I know. It closed closer to me. an why hour you, ago. Why are you over there? Come on, get over here okay. closer to me. <laughs> okay, you, fair sir. enough. All right. This is our two-year anniversary show. Thank you so much for everybody coming out here today. If you don't know, Can We Please Talk podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. We've got some fantastic guests lined up for our two-year anniversary here live in Washington, D.C., I've known this man for 26 years. We went to college together at it's Rutgers a long University. Ass time. Yeah, long ass time. <laughs> and we started this show two years ago to talk about everything happening in the world of news and politics, but not just from our perspectives, because who the hell are we, right? We want to talk to people who know what they're talking about. You're going to hear some of those folks coming up. But first, I want to play a clip two years ago to this date, Nick. You and I started this show. Uh-huh. Why don't we take a look at what it sounded like? Okay. <laughs> I love that haircut, oh, though. Feel free to laugh, people. <laughs> I'm Nick Saveri. I'm Mike Leon. We're here today just to talk about a series of different conversations. We, for each of these conversations, we take one theme and we sort of just do a deep dive into it. And our focus for, our focus for, for this Jesus Christ, Nick, get to it. Around, it's around the media. News over that time has kind of evolved. With, this guy's handsome. Um, you look like you're on Twitch, dude. Or, you know, you get your paper, and that's how you're getting your news. You know, you have one radio station, and, and you have an anchor that you may trust there. You know, what, what was your perception versus the person that you now are? Oof, that was tough to watch. I apologize for that, everybody. That is, that is how to not may, do a I show. I may be missing some. That's not that terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, we, have much, we have better mics and you know, better backgrounds. Uh, yeah, now, I was going to say, you're missing something for sure. Um, <laughs> but two years ago, like I said, we set out on a mission to really talk to people who know what they're talking about, give you guys informed perspective on the news that's happening in the day, and you don't want to hear from us anymore. So let's get into our fantastic panel of people that know what they're talking about. Let's make some noise for our guests that are coming up today. Come on, DC, make some noise. I want to hear it. All right. First up, she's a former CIA officer, former State Department spokesperson. She was an advisor to Secretary Kerry. She's a Fox News contributor. She's got to run to Fox News right after this. Give it up for Marie Harf, everybody. Give it up. Come sit right there, Marie. Uh, yeah, I'll get it for you. Yeah, that's right. I, I am. I am. And then... Next up, he's been on our show recently. If you haven't checked out the episode where we talked about the FBI DOJ investigation into former President Trump, this guy is a former FBI special agent in charge of espionage. He arrested Anna Montez, the former Cuban spy for the DIA, and he wrote a book about her coming out soon called The Queen of Cuba. This is my buddy Pete Lapp. Make some noise for Pete Lapp. Thank you. Come sit down. Pete. Being the first guest in this anniversary episode, we'll do this before the beer kicks in. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> exactly. First off, thank you for both of you being here. Uh, let's get for the people that don't know. I just gave a high-level intro. Tell us a little bit about what you did in government when you were at CIA, when you were at State Department, and then why you wanted to get into government. I'll start with you first, Marie. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I was in college on 9/11, which now feels like ancient history to the students I teach at Georgetown. But it really uh, made me believe that I wanted to be a government servant and I wanted to help in the war on terrorism. So I had been studying the former Soviet Union. Maybe I should have kept doing that now with what's going on in the news. But I I transitioned to studying terrorism, went to graduate school and applied for one job at the CIA to be an analyst covering Saudi Arabia. Thankfully, I got that job. My parents were very grateful for that. And a few years into that job, a press job opened up. And no one at the CIA wants to be a spokesperson. They think we should not talk. For the reporters in the room, you know what I'm talking about. Um, And so I gave it a shot. And in the 15 years since then, my career has been focused on how do we explain to Americans why what we're doing overseas matters to them. Right, and that's a hard challenge to, to explain to someone why Ukraine matters to them, why uh, these faraway places and trade wars matter to them. And so whether it was at the CIA or the State Department, um, on political campaigns or on Fox News, that's sort of been my driving goal. And I miss government every day. I think we probably both do. Uh, the pay's a little bit better on the outside. Yeah, but, um, you know, the, it, it is 
you know, despite the deep state and all the Republicans hating on like government workers, it's a pretty great job if you can get it. Well, well, don't don't jump the gun here, Murray. We're going to get sorry. into that in a second about distrust in government. Pete, for you, FBI special agent, I just mentioned before in the intro how you arrested Anna Montez. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to work at the bureau. So we haven't had this conversation. I too am from Jersey. Perfect. And I'm the and only non-Jersey person. Yeah, this is a Jersey yeah. panel. Uh, yeah. But when I was numbered. in high school, growing up on the Jersey Shore, I wanted to be the next Bon Jovi. Okay. Because you either were a Springsteen guy or a Bon Jovi guy. <laughs> I grew up in the hairband phase, and and I I knew that I had to have some talent. I didn't have quite that much talent. So when I got to college. I needed a plan B, and my goal in college, I learned pretty quickly that I wanted to go into law enforcement, and, and if I was going to go into law enforcement, I pretty quickly realized I wanted to go to what I believed and still believe to be the greatest law enforcement agency in the world, which is the FBI, and I set my sights on that at a very early age, and everything I did to get into was to make myself more competitive and somehow in 1998, I snuck in and got through the cracks and was uh, very fortunate to be hired as an FBI agent. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, as, Pete, as you were just talking about that, and Maria, as you both, just being in the government space, you know, what are you noticing now from the standpoint of recruitment? People are just joining now. Like, do you both have opportunities to connect with people who are just getting into those respective bureaus? And what seems to be different when people aren't joining now? What's their reality versus when you both join your respective agencies? Well, I think, you know, I've talked to folks that have just come on to the job at the FBI, and I think the motivation is the same that I had when I came in in 1998. I think the reality is they have become much more cognizant that it's a it's a divisive time and it's a it's a it's an organization that you're going to get potentially the opportunity to work high profile cases and sometimes that's maybe not the best of situations to be in and you're going to potentially cause yourself to be under a lot of scrutiny that's probably a reality um, unfortunately and not something that i had to think about when i was coming into the organization like i am going to be part of a big investigation I was just happy to get in and was fortunate to become part of a, a good news story, a successful story. But today's world, it's, 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 it's potential that you're going to be a part of something that's going to give you a lot of scrutiny and unfortunately, not often in the best of ways. What about you, Marie? Yeah, I mean, I think we all know about the hiring slowdowns during the Trump years for a variety of reasons. People didn't want to go into government at the same rate. And I think what you know, my friends who are back in this administration have, have found is that it's really hard to get over that hangover. It's been harder than they thought. It's been harder to rebuild these agencies. It's been harder to get young men and women to join. And I think that's exactly for the reasons you just said. It's also that you know, a lot of what we talk about are the rules that the Trump team broke or the, or the you know, regulations or the laws, but a lot of it was just this erosion of norms that means at a place like the CIA, where uh, certain things just weren't done under Democratic or Republican administrations, they are now, or they were, and they could be again. And that's you know coming from an organization that survived the Bush years with Iraq WMD, with the rendition, detention, and interrogation program. Like it wasn't just all rosy until we got to the Trump years. And so I think you know I teach at Georgetown now, and I think my students are looking at consulting, they're looking at Wall Street and finance, they're looking at NGOs, and we increasingly have to make a better case about why you will have impact. Because the other thing that happened was all these young people saw everything that Democrats had worked for for eight years get erased by Donald Trump. Whether or not you agree with what Trump did, it, it left this idea that we can work really hard to get an Iran nuclear deal or a Paris climate agreement or an opening to Cuba and it can be erased very quickly, and that's just a reality of our system. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned a former president, and you fed right into the segue perfectly. Uh, as you Look do, at that. I was going to say, almost as if you're on television. Uh, anyway, um, we're going to talk about the former president right now, because obviously the distrust in government, you guys have worked on the inside. Nick and I are on the outside. There's some journalists in this room that are covering it. One from Reuters here who sits every day interviewing people from the Department of Defense and, and elsewhere. The Trump administration, and specifically the former president that's now campaigning, if you want to call it that, he's out there doing his promo tour, 
And he's saying certain things that are eroding confidence over the last six years steadily in the three letter agencies that both of you guys were a part of. I want you guys to take a listen to this and we're gonna get some reaction on the opposite side. Take a listen to this. The FBI and the Justice Department have become vicious monsters controlled by radical left scoundrels, lawyers, and the media who tell them what to do, you people right there, and when to do it. They're trying to silence me, and more importantly, they are trying to silence you, but we will not be silenced, right? Well, Can I'm I not just silent. say I missed the days of Alan Dulles? <laughs> you what? <laughs> Can I say I missed the day of Alan Dulles, <laughs> formerly running the, the CIA? It just something like that would not, I mean, you could speak on this, but like, where are we now with agencies having at the White House level openly, ho open hostility? I mean, this is more of an anomaly because he's a bit of an anomaly as a president, right. but over the last few administrations, where's that push-pull have been that you both have been, fa you both have been seeing or hearing from previous um, times of, you know, in the agencies? Right, and, well, and the question is whether he actually is an anomaly going forward. I think the fear is that he's not, particularly on the Republican side. Um, but look, when I was the CIA spokesperson, you, if you had told me that only a few years later our biggest critics would be the right, would be Republicans, the ones that wanted us to do everything during the war on terrorism, you know, they were pushing us to Iraq, uh, and that it's, you know, Democrats would be more supportive. It's like Trump turned everything on its head, right? And I think you can have officers in the CIA or the FBI or any of these agencies every day doing their work and what you what you are reminded of is at the end of the day it's the president's name on the door right you can write the best memos you can write the best papers you can give him or her the best intelligence and if they don't use it and they hate you it doesn't matter for shit right and that, again, this is a norm. It's like, this isn't baked into our system. This is a norm. And once those norms start going away, I mean, this is what's so scary about, about Trump. Yeah. Pete. I mean, among many things, well, but that's yeah. one of them. Throughout that montage, I, saw, I was watching you, and I see your face like, like you're upset. I, I want you to express how upset you are as somebody who's kind of trampling on your career and life's work. Yeah, so I worked at the FBI for the last four years of my career. Uh, under former President Trump. And what was great about the FBI, what I enjoyed the most about it, every, every employee walks into that building with a political preference or a political opinion. And when you had your coffee in your hand and you hit the badge and the door opened up to start your day, you left it at the front door. We didn't talk about politics within the organization. We had lots of TVs up in the squad areas, and one day it would be Fox News, and one day it would be CNN. We did not talk politics, and it just was so refreshing. And I don't think the American people realize that it's such an apolitical organization. We at the FBI had a have a public corruption program. It's a very big program, and we arrest Democrats, and Republicans for public corruption, whether you stick $90,000 in your freezer or whether like what happened with the former governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, where he was a Republican and was arrested and convicted and charges were overturned, obviously, but for political corruption. I always felt if you were pissing off both Democrats and Republicans, you were doing, doing your, your job, job right. at the FBI. And today it's just so disheartening because so many of my former colleagues wake up every day with two goals, whether they were Russian counterintelligence or public corruption or healthcare fraud, protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. That's it, that's all they're trying to do and get home safely at night from whatever and to be able to have to put up with this bullshit, quite frankly, is difficult for them to do, but they're professionals and they tolerate it and they just tune it out and do their jobs. To you both, you're in a room full of people, of people who are not, correct me if I'm wrong, raise your hand if you are a current member of the FBI or CIA. <laughs> no? Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, a room full of people who have no knowledge of your respective fields other than what's covered on television, newspapers, other outlets. What would you say to a group of people who are just from the outside learning about the intricacies of your respective organizations that hear hate speech like that, as we just played a moment ago, to really just educate people, like, what is the reality of the work that you do? And something, and often, what is the unspoken reality of professionally what you can share uh, of working in those respective agencies? You know, the Bureau and Department of Justice, they follow the facts. 
They follow the facts, and the facts lead to meeting the elements of a crime, and it's prosecutable. They'll do that, regardless of, of, of who you are, what political background you have. Uh, you know, the, the folks that are working the Mar-a-Lago investigation, I actually know, but not for retiring, I could have been working that investigation myself. It's an espionage-related, I spent most of my career working counterintelligence and espionage. Uh, I put someone in jail for espionage. This is not something they want to do, it's their job. This allegation fell on their desk, and they're sitting there going, wow, one day I'd like to have a big case. This is not the big case that they want because of the scrutiny. The opportunity, there's been two agents that worked this case whose public inf personal information have been doxxed, whose kids are having to be taken to school by police officers. That's just not right, all because they're just doing their job. And I think that that hopefully is what we can impart to the American people, that they're just a bunch of good people trying to do their job that's been handed to them, and, and they're just there to follow the facts. What about you, Maria, on that point? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. I think every time I come on your show, I love talking to both of you, but I, I come away from it being even more sort of down about the state of things because... Oh, my bad. That's on no, you, that's on you. It's by not way. your yeah, fault. Been... You're not the problems. Because we have good conversations, and we really dive into issues, and it's not a three-minute TV hit, which I love doing, but, you know, it's not, it's not that. It's a real conversation. And for me, you just can't look at any of these things individually. Right, you, you have to look at the all out assault on our democratic institutions, on our democracy. And, and it, it's, it's whether it's going after CIA officers who are just telling the truth, right? Whether it's going after FBI officers, whether it's, it's not, it's, it's disenfranchising voters or saying you're not going to accept the outcome of an election. This is all part of one plan and play by predominantly the Republican party. And so I think even just the Trump investigations they're all part of his, you know, if you've read Maggie Haberman's book, which I'm sure many people have, like his con that he's been doing his entire life that he thinks the rules don't apply to him. Whether it's the AG in New York, whether it's Mar-a-Lago, whether it's the Georgia case, like this is a man who doesn't think rules have to apply to him. And it's all part of the same narrative, but we tend to talk about it very bifurcated. We go on TV and talk about Mar-a-Lago. We go on TV and talk about, you know, um, the New York AG, but like this is all part of a pattern and it's so much bigger than Trump. Obviously, we all know that. Right. Um, and we're going to have a bunch of election deniers win in 12 days. And that is the really scary part about where we are. Well, you just got into election denial. I want to play something for both of you because um, there's obviously talk about Director Ray from the FBI and some of the lack of action, let's say, with respect to investigations on January 6th. I want to get both of your reactions on something that I was telling you guys both off air. Andrew Weissman, the former FBI general counsel, said, so let's take a listen to this. Um, and I hate to put more work on Merrick Garland and Lisa Monica's plate, but you know the FBI is a part of the Department of Justice. Many people don't realize that, but it, they report directly into the deputy attorney general and the attorney general. And Chris Ray had a very different response to the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer where they were all over it. The deputy attorney, the deputy director, excuse me, of the FBI said this was the most significant domestic terrorism event facing the Bureau. That was the Black Lives Matter protest. Um, and yet when January 6th happened, the FBI really was asleep at the switch. And it wasn't an intelligence failure. It was a failure to act. So a lot there to process, but holistically for both of you guys, because there's been this whataboutism with what happened with Black Lives Matter protests. I thought it would be pretty easy for people to understand protests versus an election that wasn't stolen, but for there, for out now, right? I don't, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to say about that, but I want to get into what he said specifically from both of you. Mm -hmm. Director Ray's inaction in terms of what happened on January 6th versus Black Lives Matter protests. Pete, if you're still working at the Bureau, you're hearing some of that from somebody else who worked at the Bureau on air, what would be some of your reactions? Chris Ray came into the FBI after Jim Comey, and Jim Comey's personality as compared to Bob Mueller's were polar opposites. The integrity level, I think, with all three are the same, but I feel like Chris Ray's personality is somewhere in the middle between Mueller and Comey, and probably more on the Mueller side, wherein not very public, doesn't speak a lot, 
very measured, whereas Comey would talk to anybody everywhere every time, and that was just his personality. I think he's tried to let the work of the FBI speak for itself, but the downside is that there's not a lot of people out there defending the FBI or talking about things that need to be talked about, and he's got that pulpit. He's got that ability to do that. I do think that uh, January 6th was an intelligence failure, whether it was a, a failure to envision that this could actually happen, you know, that people would actually go from the left side of the barricade where you're doing this and exercising your First Amendment rights to the other side of the barricade where you're going like this. I don't know if it was a lack of creativity in terms of thinking, but certainly there was a failure there. And I do think Chris Ray had a, had a real difficult time stepping up after that um, and really speaking about that publicly. And that's been a problem. And look, I mean, the challenge is the more we get from the Secret Service text messages and others, like people should have known what was coming because it was all over there. When we talk about the CIA, one of the biggest challenges they're facing are, number one, that these platforms and the places that particularly domestic extremists congregate and talk, like our intel folks don't really know all of them. I mean, they know them and they're getting to know them better, but you know, they've moved to new platforms that were, you know, the lights were, were flashing red. So they should have known. And they did know, and I don't know why they didn't do more. I mean, second, that the biggest threat we're facing in this country is from domestic terrorism. You know, I joined the CIA because I wanted to go after Al Qaeda and bin Laden and the people that attacked us on 9-11. It is so hard for our security apparatus to sort of move the big aircraft carrier of focus um, to, away from, you know, Islamic terrorism, you know, extremism overseas to actually like the calls coming from inside the house. And I think the FBI, you know, it's hard because there are these, you know, we saw DOD go through this earlier this year when they were talking about military members who have extremist ties. They tried to walk this line. It's the behavior, it's not the allegiance. You can join an extremist group but not do something. I mean, this we don't know how to tackle this threat because I think the FBI particularly and DOD and others are nervous about, because it's American citizens and this feels like speech, often it is, but often it's not. And so that to me is this huge challenge. Like January 6th wasn't the end, it was the beginning, or not the, not the beginning, Charlottesville. No, there not. were other things <laughs> further in the past, but you know, I think that, um, and that's, that's hard, I think, across the intelligence community, I think across law enforcement, we haven't cracked that nut yet. Yeah, actually, I wanna sort of press you both on that because you just hit on something that's crucial. When we think about international terrorism, even if it's just talk, you know, even if previously Bin Laden had just put out a video, right? That in and of itself looked like a threat. When we see now organizations like the Proud Boys and these other types of groups saying stuff that speaks again to threatening our democracy, mm -hmm. you're hitting on the fact that the reaction's a little bit different because they're American citizens. Right. Is our j j overall challenge from an intelligence standpoint and a law, a law enforcement standpoint, both federally and locally, the fact that we're not quite jiving with the fact that Domestic terrorism equates to the same level of harm and damage as international terrorism, but that talks about we're getting into an element of white supremacy. We're talking yeah. about like really endemic issues in the country that we have to be square with. I, I think that's right, and not just as deadly. I mean, domestic terrorism is far more deadly inside the United States than any terrorism that's come from overseas since 9-11. I mean, just look at the numbers, run them. There's no comparison. I mean, sure, I think that they... Yes, there is, ner there is nervousness about American citizens and speech. You know, in, in the best uh, case scenario, it's nervousness about civil liberties and American citizens. I will remind people that propagandists for Al Qaeda or ISIS were considered legitimate targets uh, globally fighting terrorism, some of whom were taken off the battlefield in kinetic action. So I'm not advocating for that in the United States. I'm just reminding people how we talk about these things. I'm not saying I agreed with it then. I'm just pointing that out. Um, but at it, the, the worst case scenario is that within law enforcement, there are people who agree or who sympathize with these groups and turn a blind, and I'm not saying that's the case, but that is a scenario we have to consider. That in some places, particularly with local law enforcement, that there are people who sympathize with the Proud Boys. There were members of the military and law enforcement on January 6th at the Capitol, right close to where we're sitting today. And that is a, a societal problem that is much bigger than just figuring out the right tactics to go after these mostly guys. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, think of the word patriot, how political the word patriot has become in that term. And now we can't even 
come to a unified consensus of what that definition is. Um, hate speech is un it's disgusting, it's revolting, it's, it's repulsive, it's ignorant, and it's First Amendment protected. So if we sympathize with what happened on January 6th, if we're not calling it an insurrection, let's say we call it an incident or we call it a tour, you know, should that sympathizer work at the FBI, in the military, in local law enforcement, or are we okay with them having a First Amendment privilege and perspective on that, but do they do their jobs? When push comes to shove, are you going to go out and do an arrest on someone who has legitimate federal charges who violated the law allegedly on January 6th? That's where I think we have to draw the line, and it's, it's gray. Unfortunately, I think there's a gray area there where we start looking under the hood of the, the organizations that we work in, we might find a lot of stuff, and that's, that's something to be careful. I know you wanted to no, say something. No, 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 because I know you've been critical. You said um, when you came on with us, hey, I'm critical of the FBI when it needs to be right. critical. No, you wanted to add something onto that. No, I was, just, I was actually going to ask you where you come down on that line, because it's a really tough question, yeah. right? How now when you get a security clearance, they look at some of your social media postings. Like, yep. I, I, this is a really hard question, and I was actually going to ask where you thought the line should be drawn. So I go back to January 6th, and, um, you know, the rally at the Capitol was literally the stop to steal. The election had been over. Most Republicans... Mainstream Republicans said Joe Biden is the elected president. There was about to be a constitutional process. So under the First Amendment, people were at that rally doing this, exercising their First Amendment privilege, whether the majority of folks agree or disagree. There were barricades. And once you cross those barricades, that to me becomes the physical and theoretical dividing line because then you're no longer exercising your First Amendment privilege. You're now actively working towards stopping this you know, constitutional event. So the barricade becomes symbolic, physically, and, and almost uh, you know, hypothetically, if you will. You can do this, think all you want, and you go back to your job and you know, having a clearance the next day, you know, unless you want to resign from the government, resign from your position where you require a clearance, um, but the barricades is what's the dividing line for me. Yeah. Well, listen, before we both let, uh, let you both go, um, these people here, Nick alluded to it earlier, none of them work in government. Some are reporters that cover some of you guys. Give people optimism here that, <laughs> Marie, try not to laugh. Did you, did you did someone say, give hey, me a shot of something yeah, No, we, get, we that. gave all the, will you no, 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 I'm I'm we get, we gave I'll all, be the optimist. We, we yeah, gave, he's going to go first. first. We, I'm making him go we first. Gave the, <laughs> we gave the, the negative and we played a clip of somebody advocating for the Bureau being disbanded, right? Like, um, give the people in this room optimism as to why they should trust government or at least public office. I asked you that when you came on our show once upon a time. Can, I can, asked you, you, remi now. can you remind me of my answer? <laughs> I can I phone a friend? I don't I'm making him go first. Pete, why do we trust the FBI? I, I, I can't tell you how important that oath is that we took. Day one, the oath of the allegiance to the Constitution, not to a party, not to the person we voted for. There are so many people working in government uh, that, that, that believe in that oath and live it every day. I have friends that are still working at the Bureau. I can't tell you they're having a joyous time and enjoying their job, but they're doing their job. They're staying on their job. They're not resigning. They continue to uphold the Constitution and protect the American people and put themselves in harm's way, maybe not from physical harm, but from public scrutiny right. and from being doxxed and from being, you know, having arrows thrown at them from certain side of things. And I think that's what message I would want the American people to hear, is that there's still good people really doing a hard job, doing the best they can. And, and I think we should feel safe at night, to be honest with you. That's great to hear. And Marie's going to abstain from an answer. Because no, we, I'm no. not. I'm going to give you an answer. I don't, okay. I'm not going to do that. Um, I also think we should feel safe at night. I think that when it comes to security particularly, um, particularly national security, which is what I've spent my career on, I think that the, 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 the agencies are holding, right? I think that they are doing their job against particularly foreign 
enemies. I'm much more concerned about the domestic situation. But look, I'm optimistic because I have to be. We have no other option here, right? There's not like a different government waiting in the wings for us to call up when this doesn't work. It has to work. And as of today, 11 million Americans have already voted in this midterm election. We are on pace to out uh, outvote, to get more people to vote than we did in the 2018 midterms. We're, we're in some places, we're on pace for the 2020 presidential. Right, and so we have no other option but to fix this. And it's going to be messy, and it's going to be complicated, and it's gonna get worse before it gets better, especially depending on the next presidential election. But I'm optimistic because we have to be. There's no other, you know, there's this great scene in Zero Dark Thirty, for those of you who've seen that movie, where he comes into the conference room and he says, there's no other team out there looking for Bin Laden. You think there's these other people out there, it's just you. He uses a few expletives and I'm not gonna do up here. Appreciate He's that. like, it's just you, that's it. So you have to do it because no one else is going to. And for me, that's why I'm optimistic, because we have to be. And we leave it there. Our thank yous to Marie Harf, a former CIA officer. You can give them a hand. CIA officer, Fox News contributor, PLAP, former FBI special agent. Hey, thanks for watching the Can We Please Talk podcast. Whatever clip you just watched, we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you stick around for some more. Subscribe to the channel. My partner's over here smashing the button. Come on, do them a favor. So hit subscribe.